So today we're going to learn about recent research in the organic management of spotted wing Drosophila from a national team of researchers working on a NIFA OREI funded project. I'd like to welcome our presenters, Philip Fanning, who is the project leader at the University of Maine, Ash Sial of the University of Georgia, Kent Dane of UC Davis, and Jaina Lee of the USDA Agricultural Research Service here in Corvallis, Oregon. So with that, I'm just going to hand things over to you, Phil. All right, thank you, Alice, and thanks for all your help organizing. Um, on the next slide, I'll go to our project goals. So our project is titled On-Farm Integration of Organic Management of spotted wing Drosophila in Fruiting Crops. Uh, we're here today to present uh, our first year data from a key part of our project, which is the release of classical biocontrol agent Gnaspis brasiliensis uh, in organic fruit. Uh, so this is data from our first year, and we've two more field seasons of data, which we'll present to you in upcoming webinars. Um, our overall project goal here is to reduce the economic impact of spotted wing Drosophila on organic fruit production across the United States. Um, we're going to do this by developing and evaluating decision aids uh, and tools and thresholds for growers based on the monitoring approaches we have. We're going to integrate Gnaspis brasiliensis into existing crop management practices associated with organic farms. And then of course, develop outreach and educational programming, which we are presenting to you today. Um, I'd invite you to look at our project website, which is on eOrganic, is eOrganic.info.spotowingdrosophila, uh, and you should see that appear in the chat here soon. Um, on the next project webinar, you'll just, or on the next thing, you'll see that we have designed three project goals to achieve uh, this overall project goal uh, with a specific pro objective uh, that focuses on promoting beneficial insects in organic fields. This includes the release of a classical biocontrol agent, which is the key theme of today's webinar. Um, for our project team, you'll see in the next slide, we have quite a large project team. It's a national team uh, encompassing 10 states and 11 institutions. Um, as Alice introduced, you're only going to hear from a subset of us today. Um, but on the next slide, you'll just see how large our team is. So while all of those pictures on the previous slide were all of the PIs, all of our teams are quite large and you'll see many individuals contributed to today's webinar. And I just want to acknowledge their efforts here. Um, we also presenting data from two previous projects uh, from this team. Um, so you'll see on the next slide, uh, we've had two projects focused on controlling spotting Drosophila in organic uh, production. Um, these were led by Dr. Ash Sial, um, and he's going to start today by giving us a recap of these projects. Um, again, I point you to the eOrganic uh, Spotting Drosophila website, where you'll see a lot of the outputs from these previous projects and the associated webinars from those projects. And so with that, I'll pass you over to Ash. Thanks, Phil and Alice. Uh, this slide shows the first ever OREI project funded to develop and implement organic management programs for SWD. This team consisted of uh, researchers from 10 land grant universities and USDA scientists, as you see on this screen. And this project that was funded in 2015 ran for three years until 2018. In this project, we worked out fundamental aspects of ecology and management of SWD in organic systems. At the end of this project, we continued on with a second OREI project where we uh, continued working on those ecology and organic management aspects with a more uh, deeper understanding of behavioral uh, as well as cultural and uh, organic, uh, organically based chemical control of SWD. Today, I will give you sort of a very brief uh, summary of what we learned in those projects, just highlighting the key points. But if you have any questions that you would like to ask, feel free to put in the chat or contact one of our uh, team members that you see on the slides here. 
the overall goal of our organic uh, projects was to develop and implement systems-based organic SWD management programs that were uh, compatible with the USDA uh, NOP programs and true to the ethos of organic agriculture. The specific objectives that we worked on uh, during those projects were uh, be to investigate behavioral control, cultural control, biological control, organically approved chemical control, uh, as well as uh, implement organic SWD management strategies to and evaluate their impact. So to get into the, um, the first uh, objective of uh, behavioral control, in our during our first project, we uh, spent a, a good amount of time evaluating different baits and lures and uh, traps that we were uh, that we used to uh, sample uh, SWD. We evaluated several uh, baits and combination uh, of different baits, uh, uh, homemade as well as some commercially made formulations. Of all those, uh, yeast sugar-based baits were the most effective ones, especially when they were combined with sentry lures, which are uh, commercially available. They were particularly good for uh, capturing flies earlier in the season before fruit were ripe. And that is a very important in regions where there's a winter is long and hard and flies always uh, every season, they have to start over. This early capturing can be extremely helpful in those regions. In uh, those projects, we also evaluated several uh, new technologies, which uh, uh, some of them uh, are also now commercially available. First of those was the black technology which was developed by a company out of uh, ISCA out of uh, California. They had this uh, set of uh, attract and kill based formulation, which had spinosis, uh, spinosid as a, a killing agent, which was applied uh, uh, on the trunks or foliage of the uh, bushes or, or plants. And the idea was that the, the attractant will attract flies away from the fruit to the, uh, that formulation that way we will uh, lower the impact of SWD in the fruit. In some of those uh, locations where we tested these, uh, uh, this technology, actually this was tested in several states, uh, we did see significant impact uh, on SWD populations in some locations, up to 87% uh, reduction in a number of flies per uh, pint of fruit, as you see over here. Uh, later on, that same company actually separated the active the attractant uh, from the uh, killing agent. And they also developed some new products uh, that were more attractive than the original one. OR1 here is the original product that they had as attractant. And then they developed a couple more. A TD is the one that was the more um, sort of uh, improved version of that. And we, when we tested, that was uh, a much that performed much better than the original version. It was actually competitive uh, with the natural fruit, as you see here, especially blackberries, uh, strawberries, and blueberries. It was just as good as fruit, but raspberry was slightly more attractive than the combination of interest and TD. And the last technology that we tested was food grade gum attractant that was developed by uh, one Walton's program out of Oregon State. This technology has showed a lot of promise. It has been uh, registered and actually released, uh, I think, worldwide and is commercially available now for control of SWG. Cultural control is another aspect that is extremely important for organic SWG management, and we did a lot of uh, uh, work on that. The idea is to basically manipulate the environment or habitat such that it becomes less favorable for flies, especially SWD. It, uh, SWD flies do not like high temperatures or a low hum humidity. And if there is anything we can do in the habitat to uh, increase the temperature or lower humidity, that will help us minimize impact of these flies. So a couple of things that we tested, canopy management, we did a lot of work in multiple states and what we learned uh, is that the canopy management can work in some systems. The idea is that when you do heavy pruning, it opens up the canopy 
lets more light through, which increases temperature a little bit, reduces humidity to some extent, leading to less favorable environment for flies in the canopy. It did show promise in some systems more than others. Floor management is the use of basically multi different kinds of commercial mulches to see their impact. This work was also done in multiple states and we uh, found a significant impact on SWD survival in the field in uh, some situations. The idea is that when flies are larvae in, inside the berries are fully fed, they either intentionally or unintentionally come out of the fruit to find a good spot for pupating. In that process, they drop to the ground and uh, in the process that to get into the soil to pupate, they actually get toasted if there is a, a cover on the ground. Black weed mat and uh, those re silver leaf reflective mulches, they did show some positive results there. Physical exclusion is a foolproof technology when it comes to managing SWD if done right. That has shown a significant uh, impact in many situations. And this work was also done in, in several states. And is even though on the surface it does sound expensive, but if it works for your scale, uh, it, it, it is one of the foolproof technologies to control SWD. Irrigation is another practice if you have an option uh, between or to choose between uh, drip irrigation versus overhead sprinkler irrigation. The drip irrigation would be the best way to go because uh, overhead irrigation does increase humidity, which uh, flies uh, uh, like, and uh, drip irrigation obviously will be the way to go to keep things dry in the canopy where flies, uh, where we have a lot of fruit. Harvest frequency is another uh, strategy. The concept is to uh, harvest uh, fruit more frequently, leave less fruit, uh, ripe fruit out there, and minimize the attractiveness of the field for flies. So and a study showed that if you harvest the raspberries every two days, that was the best way to minimize impact of SWG. Sanitation, if you have lots of uh, ripe fruit uh, on the ground um, or a leftover even on the bushes, that can serve as an attractant attracted for flies to and attract, can attract them to the field. So the best way is to collect and remove those fruit from the field, whichever way possible. You can pack them in the bags and leave them in the sun for, for those flies in the berries to die, or you can bury them deep in the so soil to, to uh, kill them. If you bury, make sure to bury them at least two feet deep to make sure they don't come out uh, and become source of future infestation. If you have harvested uh, berries and suspect they may be infested, you can still uh, store those berries at low temperatures of uh, around uh, uh, 32 degrees centigrade and they, that can lower the uh, sort, of, sort of slow down the development of larvae inside the berries and even kill some of the larvae inside the berries and allow you time to uh, market those, uh, th those berries and, and uh, um, minimize the impact of that infestation. Right, so uh, when it comes to organic chemical control, we it did a lot of work. We did evaluate organic uh, insecticides. We evaluated lots of adjuvants and uh, also phagostimulants. And we did uh, uh, publish lots of papers on, on that work. And the bottom line is we added a lots of new products into the list uh, of options that organic management that can be used for organic management of SWD. However, when it comes to the efficacy, and trust was the most effective product, as you see in this screen, which shows sort of summarized results from trials conducted in several states. But you cannot uh, trust on just one product. You have to rotate and trust with uh, other products uh, to get through the season. And also, most importantly, to minimize the risk of resistance development in SWG. When it comes to using insecticides, even organic insecticides are not uh, safe to natural enemies. We did document significant toxic effects of those uh, organic products on, uh, on SWD. So when you're making uh, applications, do keep that in mind and make sure to use those organic insecticides 
in a manner that, that minimizes the exposure of beneficial insects, including uh, pollinators out in the field. So uh, when it comes to using chemicals, of course, with SWD, with, in which we have zero tolerance uh, in the field uh, or in the market, we do have to make sure fruit is protected all the time. That leads to more frequent insecticide applications in organic systems, of course, spinosad being the most important, most effective product that has been used repeatedly. And we have already seen significant levels of um, the resistance to spinosad in California's systems already. And in other systems, we have not yet documented significant levels, but we have seen some changes in susceptibility of some of the field populations, for example, in Georgia and Oregon. So to summarize uh, behavioral control, we do have uh, based on those projects, we have developed some behavioral control options which are uh, commercially available. Especially this food grade gum is actually internationally available and has some promise when integrated properly into the organic management systems based uh, programs. Cultural control options, we developed several control options that are available uh, and can be used as appropriate to your local conditions. Especially the physical uh, exclusion was one of the foolproof methods to control SWD if it works for your size and scale of the farm. Chemical control, of course, we cannot get away uh, with the uh, other options. We have to use chemical control sometimes with the, when fly populations build up. But when it comes to that, and trust was the most effective organic option to control SWD, but we did uh, a find efficacy of other products that can be used in rotation with SWD. When it comes to looking at system-wide or season-long programs, make sure to rotate and trust with other products to minimize the risk of resistance development. At this point, I will pass it on to Kent to discuss more details of the biological control, which is focus of our current OREI project. Thank you. Thank you, Ash. So we're going to shift our focus a little bit more towards natural enemies, towards biocontrol. And we oftentimes think of biocontrol with insect predators, insect parasitoids. But the team's looking at, at more than that. Uh, we're looking at the use of nematodes or fungi or bacteria. All of these organisms can be biological control agents. And they can be manipulated. So in coming years, we're probably going to focus on that as much as we're focusing on some of the imported natural enemies, the larval parasitoids that we'll focus on today. Now, much of what's been done in the past has been put into these three summary articles. It's been a nice compilation of the different natural enemies from insects, predators, and parasitoids to some of the organisms like nematodes and fungi. And these articles can be found on the uh, Spotted Wind Drosophila website. So please visit that to see a more detailed summary of what's been done in the past. Now, Ash mentioned resistance. It's hard to think of natural enemies helping to reduce the impact of resistance, but they really can. So, if you've got natural enemies working in the riparian zones outside of the cash crop, they can lower the pest pressure moving into the crop. Fewer insects moving in that have to be treated mean fewer insecticide applications, and that can reduce the development of resistance. With these natural enemies we're going to talk about today, especially the imported wasps, we don't really think that they're ever going to remove the need to spray in the cash crop completely. So hopefully we're going to control or suppress spotted wing in the non-crop areas, reducing the amount of spotted wing going into your cash crop and improving your insecticide treatments. There's a number of resident natural enemies and our team has been looking at these as well as imported natural enemies. One of the early studies showed that about 80% of the spotted wing actually pupate outside of the fruit in the soil. And Ash mentioned that when he was talking about some of the barriers that can be put on the ground 
to help control a spotted wing. Well, also when those spotted wing larvae drop to the ground and pupate, they're available for predators to attack them. A nice ex exclusion study done by Jana Lee's lab showed that about 19 to 49% of spotted wing larva was reduced and about 61 to 91% reduction of pupae by generalist predators, especially ants, but also spiders, things like minute pirate bugs. So there is a level of natural enemies already present in the US that help suppress spotted wing. So just remember this pest would be much worse if it weren't for some of these resonant natural enemies and their impact. In fact, there are two parasitoids that are found throughout North America. They're found in Europe. They're pretty much found everywhere spotted wing is found. These are these pupil parasitoids. The top one, top picture is Trichopria drosophilae, and the bottom picture is Pachycarpoideus vindemine. On their own, without manipulation, they can't control spotted wing to the level we need. We're typically finding parasitism rates someplace between one and 15 without any kind of manipulation. So teams in Oregon, Minnesota, and California looked at mass producing pachycropoideus and releasing it into hoop houses, releasing it into areas with spotted wing to see if we couldn't reduce spotted wing numbers. We did get some reduction, but the conclusion was that it was probably too cost prohibitive for the level of reduction we got. That being stated, I'll also mention that an operation in California and Mexico is currently releasing, mass producing and releasing trichopria, and they're reporting fairly good results with this. So we're going to look at this in future years of this study. But today we're going to focus most of our time on classic biocontrol. That's getting a natural enemy that co-evolved with spotted wing and bringing it back to North America. Our focus was on natural enemies found in South Korea, China, and Japan. And we made nine collection trips all together between 2011 and 2022. And it was an international collaboration with people from Oregon, Delaware's USDA, Cavi, Switzerland, our colleagues in Asia, uh, and my group in California. The way classic biocontrol works is you've got an invasive pest getting up there above the economic injury level. You don't do an augmentation. You don't release millions upon millions of natural enemies. You inoculate, you add the imported natural enemy, and over time, it oscillates with the pest population density and brings it down below the economic injury level. Sometimes this can take four or five, up to six, seven years for that imported natural enemy to release, to reach the levels to control the pest. So you have to be patient with this. In our importation efforts, we discovered about 19 different parasitoid species attacking spotted wing. These three pictures, Asobara japonica, a Ganaspa species that was identified as Brasiliensis, and Leptopolina japonica were the three most important ones that we focused on in quarantine. Taxonomy became very important because these fagidids, the Ganaspus and the Leptopolina, look very, very similar. And they're very small, about the size of the nose of the president on the dime. So we had to um, work with taxonomists to really understand what we had and what we were, were releasing as well. In this video, we see Ganaspus attacking spotted wing inside a blueberry. It puts an egg inside the spotted wing maggot and that starts to develop. And we see over on the right, that little larva developing that goes along with that uh, drawing that diagram, and that larva is kind of munching on the spotted wing inside and emerges as an adult. That just gives you an indication a little bit about the biology of this insect. 
So what can we expect? Um, these are data from one of our collections in China in 2016. First thing to note is that we had parasitism, parasitism levels typically around 20%, but they went up to about 65%. And one side, it was a, a about 75%. Notice too, that the host plant we got the material from, parasitism levels varied a little bit amongst host plants. So this is not going to be a parasitoid that wipes spotted wing out to where you can't even find it. So in Asia, we're getting between on average 20 to 60% parasitism. That's what you can probably expect. Uh, Gnaspis in red, Leptopolina japonica in yellow, they get along well together. They were found working together. So there's not going to be a tremendous amount of competition between these. I also wanna point out that there was differences between regions. We see three separate regions here in China on different host plants. So for example, within one region on Western strawberry, about 20% parasitism, but on elderberry, about 60%. So we expect to see different levels of parasitism throughout North America. They'll probably do better in different climates that we're releasing them in. And we won't know that until we release in all these different regions in North America and give these parasitoids a chance to establish and build up. One of the things that we needed to do was to get USDA permission to release this material in North America. It goes to a group called NAPO, which is North America, so it's Mexico, the US and Canada reviews our petition. Again, this was an international effort that including members in Italy, Cabbie, Switzerland, group in Delaware, group in California, and of course, taxonomists. So we knew what we were releasing was the right insects. The most important part, we looked at efficacy, we looked at biology, but there has to be this element of not causing any harm. So let's look at the three important parasitoids. We tested these against 26 different fly species. So Asobara japonica attacked almost everything we gave it. Leptopolina japonica was a little more discerning and really focused on the Suzuki group, also attacking Melanogaster simulans and persimilis, and some others a little bit. But this Gnaspa species was very discerning, really focusing only on Suzuki eye, and it could attack Melanogaster and to some extent simulants. So that's the one that we got permission to release from the USDA. We now know too that this, what we called Gnaspus brasiliensis could be broken into two different groups attacking spotted wing one called the G1, one called the G3. These are going to be given different scientific names and we have permission to release the most specialized one, the G1 strain, which really focuses on attacking Suzuki, Spotterwing Drosophila. Luckily for us, we also have an accidental or adventive population of Leptopolina japonica along with Gnaspis that were found in British Columbia and are now spreading throughout North America. So what we're doing now as a group is we're releasing Gnaspis across the US and we're also releasing within each state Leptopolina japonica and monitoring to see what impact these insects will have. So with that, I'm gonna pass this over to Jaina we will continue this. Thank you, Kent. Um, so as part of the releases, it's a national effort, as Kent mentioned, and the ORI is part of this national effort um, with releasing Gnaspis in eight states and nine by nine different teams, as you can see pictured here. And so with these releases, we want to know um, if it makes a difference. And to do this, we're uh, making releases in a release site and having a paired control site. 
And as you can see pictured here, we make a release in the center of a non-crop and the control plot also has a similar um, setup. So, and then we take samples in this non-crop area and then in one meter, 10 meters and 25 meters into the crop, we collect fruit to count the SWD infestation and whether parasitoids emerge. We set out sentinel larval traps to see if we find um, these parasitoids. And we have yellow sticky cards to count natural enemies and pollinators. And for each site, I'll show um, basically a table of the release and control site. Here in Blueberries in Maine, they set up two paired sites. And you can see they made one release of Gnaspis 300 each, and they were able to recover Gnaspis this past summer. They also recovered a Leptopelina japonica, which Kent mentioned is the other uh, parasitoid species that showed up on its own. Okay. And then in Georgia blueberries, they set up a site in Appling County, releasing um, oh, 1,700,000 wasps. Um, they have not recovered any yet, but they're still checking. They also, again, found a lot of Leptopelina in their sites. In Florida blueberries, um, they released over 5,000 in their sites and they are still checking through some of their traps to see if they've recovered Gnaspis or Leptopelina. In blueberries in Minnesota, they set up two paired sites and they again are checking their samples to see if there's recovery. In Michigan blueberries, they released a thousand Gnaspis and were re able to recover Gnaspis at this release site, as well as a lot of Leptopelina japonica. In Washington blueberries, they made two releases over the summer. Um, they had not recovered any um, wasps at this point. In Oregon blueberries, um, this is our lab. Um, we've released Gnaspis um, at these two plots here. And we did recover Gnaspis in the release and control one plots, as well as Pachycarpoides vendemiae, which is a pupil parasitoid. In another set of Oregon blueberries, they release Gnaspis here where there's a good patch of wild Himalaya blackberry, so the wasp could thrive, and they have not recovered any Gnaspis at this point. They again recovered Pachycarpoides. Now in blackberries and strawberries in California, um, they made a series of releases over the summer. Uh, they did recover Gnaspis in their blackberry um, site and also Pachycarpoides. So in summary, with the first year trends, um, we found Gnaspis recovery thus far in four sites and we are counting the SWD. It is the first year, so we don't expect it to have, um, to have differences, but we need to see what the starting level infestations are. And so in some of the sites where all the data has been processed, it, um, the starting SWD levels are similar. In uh, two sites in Maine and Florida, uh, the release site actually harbors more SWD. Um, and then, with natural enemies, two of our sites, Maine and Michigan, have a higher number of natural enemies at the release site versus the control. And then Florida and Oregon, um, the natural enemy composition is fairly similar. And then in all the sites where the data has been processed, bees um, um, or pollinators are at similar rates between the control and release site. Okay. Another thing that can be done is to manipulate the parasitoids that are out in the field. 
This is done by using an augmentorium. Basically, you're growing parasitoids outdoors. And the concept is to just add fruit to rear SWD. Now, this mesh opening is small enough to keep SWD um, inside. So they're sort of just repopulating. As long as you keep adding new fruit, they can keep their cycle going. But the mesh opening is large enough for these parasitoids such as Gnaspis and Pachycorpoides to go in and parasitize the SWD. And then the new ones that develop can then exit and go parasitize the SWD in the field. And um, we had done a series of tests with different mesh sizes and about a one millimeter um, size is, is a good size. Okay, and then um, Phil in Maine is testing these augmentoriums in the plots. So this is an opportunity to pair crop sanitation with the augmentorium. So if you call fruit, you can then just put them here. And he constructed these augmentoriums with mesh and plastic tarp. And so he has a zipper to introduce fruits and parasitoids initially. And then you see with this mesh, the SWD are stuck inside, but then the parasitoids can later leave. So in summary, um, our OREI group has released over 15,000 Gnaspis at the sites, and it's been recovered in four sites thus far. And an augmentorium with selective mesh can help boost any wasps that are already present on site. So with that, um, Bill will be closing. Okay, so thank you very much to uh, Ash, Kent, and Jaina. Um, so I guess some take-home messages. Uh, we can see that basically spotwing Drosophila is still a challenging pest for organic fruit producers. And we really have, as Ash highlighted, limited pesticide options. We're, we're still developing some tools. Uh, and trust is still an important one, but we do have some resistance issues that's come in. But we, we have been generating options, um, we'll say, in our previous projects. Um, classical biological control agents, we think will be really important in reducing the impact of this pest uh, on organic growers. Uh, so with that, we will continue releases of Gnaspers brasiliensis uh, in this project in 2024 and 2025. We'll also be conducting a lot more research associated with this project. So as part of some of our future directions, uh, you can see that in future webinars, you'll be able to, uh, we'll say, we'll present updates on the progress on our releases. We're also going to be looking at the compatibility of Gnaspis brasiliensis with organic insecticides and those behavioral controls that Ash introduced to us earlier. We're looking at the compatibility of Gnaspis brasiliensis um, with those other natural enemies that Kent highlighted, such as entomopathogenic nematodes. And then another part of the project will be advancing those SWD monitoring tools and economic decision aids, um, which again, we'll hopefully share with you um, in the future and future webinars associated with this project. As a last kind of hack tip, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about our final section of this project. A lot of our research is always done with undergraduates who are working towards completing their degree. You can see as part of this project, we developed a specific sub-objective in objective tree, um, which involves a research and extension experience for undergraduates. So this just allows the undergraduates who work so hard in our research um, to get some official training associated with the project. This year, um, we had nine great REEU fellows uh, that worked in our labs across multiple labs on this project and were responsible for a lot of the releases and data that you saw today. So we're, we're really happy to acknowledge them and we thank them for their hard work. We're looking forward to our next cohort uh, as part of this, 
um, we'll say section of our, our grant in 2025. And I'd especially like to thank uh, Mary Rogers and her team in the University of Minnesota who really have led this part of the project. In closing, I'm just going to thank on the next slide, we'll see basically just oh, some acknowledgements. As Jaina showed, a lot of our research from this last season, um, we spent a lot of time rearing these parasitoids. In the lab, they're, they can be quite difficult to rear, um, but we worked with a lot of grower cooperators that allowed us to release these at their sites. Um, we also had a lot of input from state and crop commodity groups. And finally, of course, we'd like to thank NIFA, who supports this project um, through one of their grant programs, the Organic Research and Extension Initiative. And with that, we can open it up to questions, which I see some have come in. Okay, great. Thank you very much, everyone. So um, I'll just start with the first one. Um, is there any genetic variability present on cultivars tested for spotted wing drosophila resistance tolerance, in, resistance or tolerance in blueberry or any of the other berry crops? Yeah, for the most part, host plant resistance doesn't really come into play when it comes to spotted wing drosophila, uh, given it attacks the fruit and it doesn't actually really consume leaves like we'd usually use plant host resistance for. Um, like I said, there is some studies that show when we add, add uh, calcium, it can increase basically that cuticle thickness and um, that can form a barrier for some of the, we'll say, egg laying of spotted wing drosophila. Um, but for the most plant, post hand, host plant resistance doesn't really come into play. Uh, our lab and other labs have tested various um, blueberry, strawberry, raspberry, cherry varieties. And um, I mean, while some cultivars can be more or less susceptible, they're, they're all susceptible, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, and do you think that um, essential oil products are effective? I know Ash had typed in an answer to that one. Yes, we did uh, evaluate some uh, oil-based products and essential oils in uh, our projects, and overall efficacy was very low. As compared to, again, we always use the standard of uh, 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 antrustor spinosad. Okay, let's see. And here's a question from Chris, um, who works in sweet cherries. How much does GF120 or any other bait plus spinosad product impact the resistance game we're all playing with group five sprayables, contact resistance versus ingestion resistance. For example, do we need to be as careful with GF120 as we are with interest? Uh, actually, the label uh, regulations do apply to any form of application when a product is applied in the field, be it uh, attract and kill me mechanism or just a spray. So, and flies also get exposed to the residues the same way, or even more likely to do so when there is a tractant mixed with the toxicant. So yes, with the, as far as resistance is concerned, which we should be careful just as, as much as with the spray application when using those attractant kill tools. Is the route of exposure and mode of action for Grandivo activity on spotted wind Drosophila understood? Um, I would say not yet. Uh, a lot of these, um, we'll say, biopesticides, it's really hard to pinpoint the route of exposure. I don't know if Ash wants to chip in. I know Ash's lab has worked on this a lot, but I don't think we fully pinpointed the route of exposure for Grandivo yet. It, it is uh, actually uh, better studied in lepidopteran systems, uh, but not in SWD. We, we are not clear, but we do see moderate to, to set up low efficacy in uh, different situations. Okay, great. Um, in the harvest frequency experiment, what were the frequencies you tested? Um, do you have any notes on whether morning or evening picking made a difference? Uh, yeah. Picking, as far as picking is concerned, I don't think that makes any difference, but the timing of spray application is what is most important when it comes to uh, protecting uh, beneficial insects out in the field from spray residues. Always, it is always recommended to uh, spray 
early in the morning or late in the evening to minimize exposure of the beneficials. Okay, and um, can you please explain the food grade gum attractant method as a means of controlling SWD and how that would work? I wish we had uh, uh, Juan Walton. He's on the, uh, in the audience. I don't know if he can speak up, but he is the one. Juan Walton out of Oregon State developed this uh, product from uh, in beginning till it was commercialized. And uh, his, he has done extensive uh, research on this product. It is an attractant that basically attracts flies away from the berries where they actually, and also provides a medium for uh, oviposition. So instead of laying eggs in the fruit, flies lay eggs in the gum that results in overall a lower infestation uh, in the in the fruit. So that is how it works. But uh, uh, if you have more questions, I would suggest contacting Juan Walton directly. Good oh, answer. There. Great. <laughs> yeah, I think you explained it quite well. Thank you so much. Thanks, okay, Juan. great. Yeah, thanks, Vaughn. Good. Um, okay. Will any other GB parasitoids be imported into North America? Yeah, there's a, a, a number of questions related to this, so I'll try to answer most at the same time. The, G, the Gnaspis we're working with now is from Tokyo. It's the most selective of the Gnaspis near species Brasiliensis, or the G1 strains. We know that there's strains in South Korea and China that appear to be more aggressive. So like any classic biocontrol project, we're starting with the most selective material. And if that doesn't do a good job, we'll expand out and try to bring something in that might be a little more aggressive with a little broader host range, but we're limited. We can't really go outside of the melanogaster group. So um, we do hope to go back this year, um, bring some more material in, more of the Ganaspis G1 strain. Um, there's also a question that had to do with if these parasitoids are commercially available. The Ganaspis brasiliensis material or the G1 strain and the Leptopolina are not commercially available. The, trico, the pupil parasitoids, different insectaries have been looking at this material to see if there might be a market for it. Um, again, we're gonna work with a commercial group looking at Trichopria this next year to see if it's got any potential um, to be manipulated. As far as habitats to promote biocontrol insects, typically with habitat manipulation, they do really well against, they do really well with generalist predators. They don't tend to do as well manipulating numbers of specialist parasitoids like Gnaspis. What they need is the host. Um, and so that ties into a question from Roy. Yes, the Gnaspis G1 we've got from Tokyo is, is very specific to Suzukii. But in the insectary, we're getting it to come out of melanogaster. If it's so specialized that it only attacks Suzukii, this can be limiting because as the numbers of Suzukii get really low in a certain area, and it might just because they're overwintering or during the summer, their numbers go down, that can reduce the overall numbers of the parasitoids. And then it will take them longer to recover build back up to a size that then can control uh, the pest. Yeah, will the, um, will the G1 be commercially available? I don't think it ever will be because it's too hard to rear. Uh -huh. um, I think that there is um, another, it, there's another species which is really closely related to it. And it's what we refer to as the G3 strain. And it can be reared on Melanogaster. Um, it would have to, sh I don't know if we'll ever get permission to release that. Leptopolina um, can also be reared on Melanogaster. And that's a possibility in the future um, for someone to mass rear that. But um, right now, there's no one looking at that as far as I know. Okay. 
Um, our homemade trap, the homemade traps that, um, still a viable suggestion for control? Uh, so I can take this. Uh, homemade traps can be viable in some situations depending on size and scale, but based on our you know more recent research, we actually are moving away from homemade traps because just because of the convenience and uh, other uh, operational factors associated with them. Now we do have commercially available uh, traps and lures that are really effective and much more convenient to use. You don't even need to, in smaller organic uh, settings, you don't even need to put them in the field. You can just put them around the field at a couple locations to check whether the flies are active or not. And that's all, all you need, basically. There are sentry lure and uh, trace lures that are available. Some of them are actually very specific to SWT as well. So uh, red panel traps baited with those one of those commercially available uh, lures would be a way to go at this point. Yeah, I'll, I'll add here in Maine, we, we still do use the yeast sugar mixture that Ash mentioned earlier. Um, it's, it's still pretty commonly used and it still is very effective as well. There are a lot of really good commercial options too. Another question while I'm here is, uh, is Actra uh, available commercially? There was some complications with the company to get this product registered. I think they are still working, but uh, uh, I don't think it is uh, co uh, commercially available yet. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, let's see. We had a question about whether there are any types of sprays, for example, um, kaolinic clay that could prevent the spotted wing drosophila from damaging fruit. I know there is some work going on out west uh, using surround, which I think is one of these Hellenic clays, um, but I'm not sure if they have published any results yet, but they, there are people, I think, looking at them. Um, uh, we had casted Hellenic clay early on, and I guess we did not find it that promising, so we didn't pursue it much further. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess the issue is with the residue that it leaves on the fruit, it mm. becomes really problematic, especially with raspberries and blackberries or even blueberries. To what extent are migrant SWD into an area contributing to insecticide resistance? What if there are lots of wild, untreated alternate hosts in the area? Um, for the most part, we have not seen resistance outside California yet. Um, we have tested quite a lot under a different project led by ASH. Um, but we haven't seen any resistance outside California. We do know we get some movement around the country, um, but resistance hasn't been found. And we think wild populations outside and interbreeding with other populations might help with that. Um, let's see, we have a couple questions about um, the potential for um, plant breeding approaches for to um, spotted wing drosophila. Um, in other words, what potential is there for a plant breeder to have an impact on reducing SWD or is horticultural control the way forward for the foreseeable future? That's an excellent question and with the kind of te technologies that we have available in the realm of biotechnology it is always possible but in the sh uh, it may be applicable or maybe available in the field in the very long long into the future. There's nothing on the horizon at this point that will be effective enough to control pests like SWD. What do you recommend for monitoring SWD? Yeah, I think as Ash mentioned earlier, there's a lot of really good commercial lures and red panel traps that have been used. Um, so it very much depends on people's preference, whether they want to try some, some homemade traps with that yeast and sugar bait um, that we mentioned, um, or to purchase commercial lures from and the likes uh, from many different companies that sell them. Um, it, it really depends on the person's, we'll say, how much they want to get their hands dirty. Um, let's see, we have a question. Um, G is G1 is highly specific to Suzuki. I, do you believe this specific specificity poses a drawback to the successful establishment and population size of the wasp? Yeah, I, I, I talked about this just a little bit. Ab absolutely, it does. I mean, it would be fantastic if it would attack um, but not hurt other species like Melanogaster, such that um, its population has got an alternate host to go to. Um, again, we start with the most specialized and then 
maybe some of the material we'll bring in in the future will be a, a little bit less specialized. But um, once it starts attacking any native flies or has a broader broad host range, then you just can't get permission to release it from uh, USDA and NAPO. Okay. Um, is anyone looking at the nutritional balance of minerals within the plant and potential resistance or tolerance from SWD? Most of the research focuses on, again, calcium that we'll say we we were thinking uh, has a part to play or it's been shown has a part to play in thickening the cuticle of the fruit um, that reduces some of the, we'll say, egg laying that spotting Drosophila can do. Okay. Um, what guidelines can you offer for effective physical exclusion? I know Jaina mentioned mesh size and Ash did as well. Physical exclusion, again, depends on the level of uh, 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 enclosure that you have in the, the fabric that is used. Again, less than one millimeter mesh is uh, ideal for excluding flies. And also, again, during the high pressure, high population density uh, timings are critical. Even when one person can actually uh, introduce uh, flies when they in, get in and out of the uh, tunnels, if, if that is the tunnel uh, situation. So uh, idea, it is ideal to, be, to, to use um, fabric that has less than one millimeter mesh size and also be very careful with the uh, opening and closing of the doors and implement or, or start uh, put that meshing around before uh, SWD uh, susceptibility starts in the fruit, which means before the fruit start to change color. That should help. Um, let's see, Vaughn had a question here. Any thoughts on sterile insect technique? A lot of genetic uh, work is going on in different parts of the world within the U.S. and abroad. And uh, uh, it, again, all is at this point experimental level. Nothing has become commercially available due to lots of regulatory uh, issues. But yes, a lot of work is going on. There is promise in those technologies, but regulatory uh, hoops and uh, are a, a big hurdle uh, at this point. Okay, we had a question that um, Jaina had um, typed an answer to. Will any part of this study look at beneficial nematodes? So there are um, lab groups, Frank Zalem and Oscar Liebert are testing um, beneficial lab nematodes. And um, we are planning um, a field trial to deliver beneficial nematodes via drip. And um, we are also getting prepared to do a compatibility study because if um, beneficial nematodes will be applied, we want to know uh, how that interacts with um, SWD that are already parasitized by Gnaspis. So that hopefully will be presented next year. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, let me just check the chat here and see if we have any additional questions. Um, let's see. No, we just have a note to say that we have someone from Brazil on this webinar. So that's very exciting. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for all these questions. And as I mentioned, you'll be able to find the recording of this webinar on the eOrganic YouTube channel within the coming week. And we'd be very grateful if you could fill out our follow-up email survey, which you'll be receiving shortly. So thanks to all the presenters so much. And thank you all for joining us today.